two rotations that we that I was talking about last time. Um, the uh, uh, the question went as follows. You see, the uh, I'm just reminding you where I was where I was stuck and uh, when I think the resolution is. Um, uh, you remember that we had, let's say, a Euclidean space correlation function, which was uh, G Euclidean of T defined by G Euclidean K and K bar. Let's say I go and take pi omega and T Euclidean. And you remember that what we wanted to do was to continue T Euclidean. We wanted to continue with the joke of set it equal to. We wanted to make the substitution. T is equal to E pi alpha T. A little bit alpha. Right? That would be, that's the continuation that would make e to the power minus minus h t would go to e to the power minus i h t, uh, which is uh, what we want. And uh, uh, we wanted to know what what this continuation implied, or what this continuation meant for the Fourier transform. Okay. So uh, one way of thinking of this. Uh, of this thing is as follows. You see, as uh, um, as we try to emphasize, as I sort of indicated in the last class, um, this whole idea of uh, uh, analytic continuation in time requires a certain ordering. In time. Okay, the uh, the evolution operator from T i to T e. Um, Analytically continuous to e to the power minus beta, let's say T e, eh, T f minus T i, under the operations that we've been talking about, only if T f is greater than T i. Okay, so implicit in this whole procedure is this idea that the final time is later than the initial time, because otherwise this would give you a plus, a positive sign, and then the path integral over intermediate states would diverge, because you would have Applying uh, up contributions from arbitrarily high energy states. Okay, so that's why why important to keep in mind. Okay, so in uh, similarly, if we put some insertion here and another insertion here, uh, the evolution from here to here is only well defined if this time is later than that time. Okay, so in this Euclidean co in this Euclidean uh, in this Euclidean uh, uh, correlator that we're talking about, we should think of. Uh, this T E here is having a definite sign, and we're choosing we're choosing convention so that sign is positive. Okay. Now, suppose we look at the, defi the, de the definition of this this Green's function start. <coughs> okay, that was key physical. That there's a positivity of T. Everything else is nothing. Okay. Um, the, if we look at the definition of this object here. Uh, this object is defined by a contour integral over a contour that runs like that. Contour that runs over the real axis. Okay? But if you remember what in uh, our field theory, the pole structure of our, of our Green's function was. And it had one pole here, so that the poles were at omega squared plus k squared plus m squared is equal to zero. So omega equals plus minus i of square root of m squared plus k squared. Okay? So the poles were here and here on the uh, in the omega plane. Now, because T is positive, the contour integral that we uh, we want to do, yeah, can actually be at no cost complete to this because the integral over the imaginary part here just vanishes. Because when omega is positive imaginary part, this guy here is very highly negative, and so it's exponentially negative. So the contour integral, okay, that gives us uh, the, the, the Fourier transform can be reworded because of the positive of this t, okay, as a contour integral. Okay? And now the continuation is right here because now we've got a contour integral, we can move the contour around. 
however we want, provided we don't uh, cross any of the singularities. One way that we will not cross any of the singularities is this. Okay? To, uh, to any angle that we're interested in, as long as that angle does not exceed pi by 2. Because once we exceed pi by 2, we will cross the singularity. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now, you see, uh, now the point is that what, what we want to do is to set this equal to that. So first, even before setting this equal to that, the expression for this object as, you know, a function of t, um, uh, it can be reworded as, the, as this integral over this quantity. Now we use this expression for the object to do the, suppose we want to do the analytic continuation uh, of t up to an angle near pi by 2. We will cross, rotate this contour. Suppose we want to do the analytic continuation to e to the power i, to e to the power i alpha times t. We rotate this contour pi alpha. Okay? That will basically, you know, cancel these, these two alpha factors here. Yeah? Because, uh, this was a positive rotation of t, but we've done a negative rotation of the contour. Okay, so we're effectively rotating omega by a negative, negative rotation to cancel the positive rotation. So that this guy, so that this guy remains unchanged. That is, along the variable that, that, that goes along this contour, we will still have an e to the pi i omega prime times t prime. Okay, up to the fa overall factor that we pick up the measure that we discussed last time, for d omega going to is equal to minus e uh, to the power minus i alpha because we change the quantity. Okay, now with this new contour and this new rotated t, you can easily check for yourself that this part of the integral continues to vanish. It's the same argument. Sir. Okay? And therefore, we can just ignore this part. We can do this for any alpha, but in particular, I'm alpha going to almost pi by 2. Okay? This is one way of arguing that the analytic continuation uh, just implies uh, an inverse analytic continuation of the frequency. Of course, you might find this very intuitive. You know, I think most textbooks wouldn't even bother to talk about it. Right? If t goes to it, clearly omega goes to minus i. Okay, whatever that means, whatever that claim means. I mean, this is one way of arguing. Even though these arguments usually work, but once in a while they don't, and then you get in trouble. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So this was the clearing up from last time. Any uh, questions about it? Okay. Now, since we talked about the analytic continuation of the path, the, uh, I, I plan in this uh, in this lecture to start our discussion of renormalization. Okay, so let, let me tell you how I plan to structure this course. Okay. Um, I'll try to structure the course. Let's say we have about 25 lectures. I'll try to structure this course as roughly half and half. In the sense that the first half, we've done maybe five or six. So, so lecture. Now, the first half of the course will be on relatively elementary material. It's like uh, discussions of path and was clearly very elementary. Uh, we're going to have like, two or three uh, lectures discussing renormalization, okay? Which is also elementary in the sense that it's just part of the basic technology of the subject. And uh, uh, we will also then have uh, some discussions of beta functions of particular theories, and maybe of other technical issues like anomalies and instant terms. Okay. Uh, this, that's uh, uh, what I hope will not take us past the first half of the class. Okay. Uh, in the remaining half of the class, what I hope to do is to turn to particular examples of quantum field theories. Uh, I try to understand their dynamics. Uh, I hope to study the Toft model for another in order to understand confinement of QCD in two plus one plus one dimensions. Some other large end models uh, to understand Wilson Fisher type scaling behavior and so on. Uh, let's see how far we go. Okay. Um, so that's the plan. I hope we don't get, don't spend too much time on the, on the more inventory. But let's go. Um, okay. Uh, so, so, so let's get it. So, 
Um, in the last class, we 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 uh, discussed this this this, uh, this analytic continuation of the path of Tegma, and the main idea, of course, was uh, that uh, uh, the main idea was that we uh, we wanted to take, take this oscillatory path of Tegma that was not terribly well defined and convert it into a damped path of Tegma that was well defined. So we decided to defi define Intel pump minus IHT as a continue as the analytic continuation of e to the power minus h t. So that was the basic idea. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I just a couple of words about how this analytic continuation works. Oh, uh, even for that, uh, that is actually a that is actually here that is quite a sort of unexpected payoff uh, from this from this uh, from this exercise. It seems logically disconnected to what we're doing. It's very interesting. It's very useful. And uh, that's the following. Um, the quantity e to the power minus beta h, independent of any analytic continuation of quantum mechanics, of a quantum, uh, quantum mechanics evolution operator, is of course quite a famous object in physics by itself. Um, and uh, the reason it's famous is that the trace of this object um, has a name, it's called the partition. Uh, the partition function is the fundamental object of equilibrium statistical physics. If you can compute the partition function, you can compute all thermodynamic quantities of an object. It's a, a basic object to study in statistical physics. Uh, it study reveals properties of the phase structure, the theories, and all, all kinds of things, as, as you know from your studies. Now, the payoff that we've got from our little discussion is a very interesting little formula. You remember that we found a formula for what this was between any two states. Okay? So suppose we have psi, uh, psi e to the power minus beta h times psi. Then what we found was that this was equal to e to the power minus s equation of the field of energy. Yeah? D phi. This part of the integral is done over the field. Um, from time 0 to time beta. And then at time 0, we convolute this expression with a wave function. The wave function psi. And at time chi, uh, time beta, we convolute that expression with a wave function chi. Chi star. Okay? That was the uh, time these convolutions. Okay. But, uh, now we're interested in not this, uh, this uh, in, in order to compute the quantity of interest to statistical mechanics, we, this is very close, except we want the trace. Now, the trace can be written on a particular basis. The basis could be the field basis. Okay? So, we can draw, take this trace and rewrite it as integral d phi. Uh, this d phi of x at one particular time. Phi of x e to the power minus beta h phi of x Okay? So a particular example of this thing here was that if you had some phi of x some particular let's say phi 1 of x and phi 2 of x then this pass integral could be done Subject to the boundary conditions that at time t till 0, we were at phi, that's what it's 1, it's 2, at phi 1 of x, and t equals beta, we were at phi 2 of x. Okay? But now look, here would be plus phi of x times phi of x. So that's the boundary conditions that from at t equal to 0, you have the same phi as at t equals beta. Okay, same phi, but which phi? The point is here, we don't care because we integrate over all. So do you see that this generates a path integral with such that time, the Euclidean time, has become a circle of circumference beta. And all fields are required to have, um, you know, to be periodic on this time circle. Okay? So we get a beautiful formula. We get the formula of the Z beta is equal to this, where phi is on this space, where time has become a circle, space 
whatever it was. Okay? And all the fields are, they, oh, there are no boundary conditions satisfied for the path of table apart from those of periodicity. Can you give me the last part of the answer? Okay. Periodicity. You see, in order to compute the trace, we want the initial phi and the final phi to be the same. So that's how you compute the trace. Okay? Now, they have to be the same, but what same value? That we don't care about. We integrate over all values. So you see, now look, look what we're doing in the path of time. In computing this transition amplitude, we were doing a path of time in touch. We're integrating over all values of phi this time, this time, this time, this time. But at this time and this time, uh, phi was fixed to your initial value and your final value. Now, however, the quantity that we want to compute has this initial value set equal to the final value. But not equal to anything particular. Just absolutely arbitrary. So this just becomes another step of in the integral in the path integral. So this field configuration is integrated over just like this one was, and this one was, and this one was. Except that it's equal to this. So that's effectively doing the path integral not on the not on R3 times R1, but R3 times S1. Where the circumference of S1 is big time, because that's the time difference. Do you see? So we, we arrived at a very simple but very interesting, very useful formula. And the formula is that the partition function of our the partition function of our quantum system or quantum field theory at inverse temperature beta is given by a very simple path integral formula. The path integral formula is take the uh, take the action, uh, take take uh, uh, perform the path integral of the system after Euclidean continuation. Okay? And on the manifold, whatever your spatial manifold, R3, that's what you're interested in, times S1, where the information of the temperature goes into the, into the circumference of S1. And the circumference is B. Uh, so do we, since, since time is kind of closing in on itself, yeah, well, this is Euclidean time. So it's analogous to space. Exactly. So there's no issue of causality. You know, causality has to do with the light cone. The light cone is an inherently mean constraint structure. All of the light cone goes to a point in Euclidean space. Because those those points that are whose distance from another point is zero. And in Euclidean space, there's no Okay? So causality requires some discussion of the Lorentz. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions to comment? Okay, excellent. Now, uh, since we've got this far, I'll, I'll, I'll go through one more little, uh, little uh, diversion, uh, which is to, uh, which is to try to uh, remind us or uh, uh, try to deduce how the same object here, how the same uh, uh, this. Uh, um, how uh, this 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 formula or an analogous formula of this sort? How this formula or an analogous formula of this sort works for uh, uh, works for uh, fermionic path integrals? Now you might remind, remember. Uh, okay, I, I definitely right before the next class said your problem set. So this was one of the problems that we half worked out class, then I asked you to finish this derivation for how to do part, fermionic path, path integrals for far minus. IHT, so I'll ask you in a problem set to do some manipulations with that. But uh, you might remember that we concluded in class that if we had uh, a two state system, um, you remember we had this operators, uh, this, these operators psi and chi, uh, which were raising, raising and lowering operators respectively. And we had the special state psi, which was, no, I don't remember which way, psi down to psi. That's not for me. Yeah, we have the special state. So um, uh, this guy was the lowest operator. This guy was raising. And our special state was uh, uh, psi, which was down uh, plus psi times up. 
Uh, you remember that uh, uh, we also defined this ket sign, which was not the ket corresponding, not the dual of the states. Okay. But it was uh, defined so that psi prime psi was equal to uh, uh, psi prime to psi. And uh, uh, the nice thing about this uh, uh, this Kett and Brar uh, notation uh, was that there was a complete distribution. Psi, psi, psi. Okay? Because of this completeness relation, it follows that the trace of any operator, the trace of an operator A, okay? Um, uh, the trace of a, any operator A um, is the same thing as the trace of psi d e psi psi integral uh, integral psi. Okay, but because we are in trace, we can take this to that side. Okay, so this is just. So that's just integral uh, d psi psi a psi. I did this wrong because no, let me let me. I, I did this wrong because I took uh, something through something else. I and mean, in fact, that's the point. Give give me so. So uh, let me stop this again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, let us, the point was to try to determine, the point was to try, this is true. So this is a true relation that we can insert inside. It's a part of the, the point of this exercise was to try to determine the relationship between the trace. Okay, what is, okay, question, what is psi A psi D That's the question. Okay. Now, of course, this is a very easy question to answer. So, in this nice two-state system. So, we know what psi is, and we know we know what this. We also had an expression for this psi prime. But actually, the only important things about this psi prime, the facts that we had checked, was that psi prime uh, on uh, down was equal to one, and psi prime on up. Okay, these two relations allowed us to, of course, to solve for what that side prime was. I don't remember the solution. These are all that we need. Okay, so now what we want to do is to determine this object. So we just expand it out. So that's a d psi, psi a acting on a acting on uh, well this side. This was down plus psi times up. Okay. Now, right. Now let's look at a acting on down. A acting on down could either give us down or up. Because A is some arbitrary operator. Okay? Now, so A acting on down gave us up. Then we would have up times psi. But up times psi is 1, whose integral is 0. So the term where A acting on down gives us up doesn't contribute. The term where A acting on down gives us gives us down does contribute because a uh, because uh, down uh, psi on down is psi is psi according to this formula yeah. and d psi times psi is one so this whole expression here is equal to a down down the matrix element of a such as acting on down is this clear? 
On the other hand, let's look at this object here. It's the reverse. A acting on up, giving down, will produce another psi when we take the zeta product. And since psi squared is zero, that will not work. Therefore, when this guy acts on this, the only thing that contributes is A acting on up to give up. But A acting on up uh, to, to give up produces, then gives, you, gives us another minus sign. Because psi prime with the up was minus one. And so we get minus A up. The interesting relationship is that that psi a psi is equal to trace of minus one to the f times a, where. I define this operator f as follows. Okay? Let the operator f be defined such that operator f is defined as f on our two state system. Uh, let's say we're acting on the basis uh, f on down is equal to down and f on uh, up is equal to A, 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 uh, it's sigma 3 in this uh, two state system. Now, why do I call it F? I call this this, 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 this this operator F because F is supposed to remind me of fermion. Now, why do I call this fermion? This is because in our application of this path integral, we're going to apply it basically to the Dirac system. Now, the Dirac system, let's say the free Dirac theories first. Okay? Um, it's just a bunch of these fermionic harmonic oscillators. One or a few, depending on how many dimensions. Uh, sorry, is it minus one less two f or just f? If I like it. Ah. Ah. Uh, uh, I think the eigenvalue is minus one less two. Yeah, minus one less two f. I think one down is down. Yeah, you're probably right. Just zero. Yeah, I think you're right. So I suppose that makes for the way. Wouldn't that be this? Ah. Ah, ah, ah. So you're right. F on. I'm sorry. You're right. This would be the definition that F on down is equal to zero. And F on up is equal to up. But the eigenvalues of F. The Yes, exactly. Occupation. Yeah, the eigenvalues of F are zero on down and one on up. Right? This would imply this. This is what we want, and this is what our f is. Exactly, thank you. Okay, now, uh, as we said, sorry, uh, we're, we're interested in working this out with the Dirac system. And the Dirac system is just a bunch of fermionic harmonic oscillators. One for, a, or a few for every moment. One for every moment, let's speak, basically. Okay? Now, you know, when we have a part as you know from your study of the system, the the the, 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 the at least for the positive energy states. And let's look at that. <coughs> yeah, for the positive energy states. All of them. All right. So um, when you've got no fermion there, okay, that's this down state. The up state is when you have a fermion. You see, why was two state systems, why were two state systems of interest to quantum field theory? Two state systems were of interest to quantum field theory because all fermionic field theories are a bunch of two state systems. So for every momentum mode, you either have the fermion or you don't. Is this clear? Now, so from this way of looking at it, F is the usual fermion. Okay, 
It's a question. I'm just counting how many fermions you have. Okay? And so the trace that we want is trace of minus 1 to the fermion number. Of course, you can easily check for yourself that now we are not doing a two state system, but two two state systems. Here, the flip of the spin occurs because of the absorption of fermion instead of absorption. No, 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 this is not real spin. This up and down has nothing to do with physical spin, if that is the application. Up and down should just be regarded as occupied or unoccupied. Okay. Okay? You see, when we quantize the fermionic field, we've got this creation operator, this fermionic creation operator. We've got that way A. A K A K prime is equal to delta of K minus. That's a number. Okay? And the vacuum is the state in which for every positive energy, I mean all these positive energy, and they're all annihilated by A K. Then we can make states by acting with A K delta. So every K we've got one of these fermionic two state systems. Okay? For each momentum state, the unoccupied state is what we have here called down. And the occupied state is what we call down. Nothing to do with which bit. Is this clear? And so from that point of view, this is of course the normal definition of fermion. Just how many fermions you have. Okay? And why uh, um, fermion? Number in general in the quantum field theory is not a conserved quantum. So you can easily have processes that take two fermions to four. Minus one to the f is conserved. This is because fermions are always destroyed or produced in pairs. Uh, just because all fermions have half intact integer spins, while the things that they can decay into the bosons. Always have integer spins. It's never possible to have one just angular momentum conserved if one fermion decays into bosons. Okay? So while f itself is only a conserved quantum number in free quantum field, minus one to the m is a conserved quantum number in all quantum field. Okay? So this basic formula here is very important. This basic formula here is very important. Okay? Uh, uh, this basic formula here is very important. It tells you that when we try to compute, uh, uh, when we try to compute this quantity, psi a psi, by identifying the uh, initial and final. Uh, so, so, so what we concluded, we concluded that the analogous thing, the analogous thing, that is the Euclidean constant integral for fermions with periodic boundary conditions on a circle of, of circumference beta with periodic boundary conditions does not give you trace e to the power minus beta h. It in fact gives you trace uh, minus 1 to the f times e to the power minus beta h. Uh, how are you interpreting uh, the minus 1 to the power f operating? I understand f uh, the acting on the states just tells you whether uh, there is an occupancy or uh, there is no occupancy, right? Uh, raising it to uh, minus one to that power. Minus one to that power is just because you know what we wanted for some operator yes. that gives sine plus one to down yes. and sine minus one to. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Minus one to the power zero is one, yes. but minus one to the power one is minus one. Right. Okay. So, but there is of course a much simpler way of thinking of this, this operator minus one. It's just an operator which is one. If the total number of fermions in your system is equal. Okay? And minus one if the total number of fermions in your system is odd. Now this two state system uh, that's equivalent to what I said, because the total number of fermions can only be either zero or one. But now we can have two two state systems. Okay? For each of them, this derivation would go through. And we would get minus one to the power f one plus f two. But F1 plus F2 is total fermion. Okay? So we will always look out, think of F as a total fermion number system. Is this clear? Yes. 
So it's minus one to the f is just something that grades inverse space into even and odd parts and multiplies the odd parts by minus one. Is this clear? Uh, okay, yeah, until here it's clear that now what minus one to the power f does, but why would it now appear in, in the trace? Uh, why would it appear? Yeah. This is a matter of, you know, between you and God. <laughs> <laughs> All we can see is what does happen. Why is a tough question? How is the physics of uh, uh, different if you have an odd number of fermions or an even number of fermions? Uh, see, 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 let's see. So what, what have we seen? We've seen that there is a, a formula yes. relating this integral to trace of minus 1 to the power f times a. Yeah. Is the algebra that gives you that clear? Yes. Oh, the right hand side? Yes. Fine. Okay. So, all that we have deduced is the following that if you do a path index, you see, it's just a technical observation. Okay? A technical observation that will actually be very important. But it's a technical observation. Okay? The technical observation is that while path integrals with periodic boundary conditions. Yes. On a Euclidean circle, uh, compute the thermal partition function in, for both sides. Path integral with periodic uh, 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 periodic boundary conditions do not compute the thermal partition function for uh, for fermions. They compute something a little different. Okay. This is not to say that you know there's some diff inherent difference. I mean, there are differences whether the Fermi numbers or even you know, this net spin can be zero. Can't be zero, for instance. But uh, that's not for important of importance. It's just a simple technical observation. So uh, can I? Uh, I mean, this is also just an observation. So can I say that uh, when the number of uh, fermions in the system is even, yes, when the partition function is similar to that of a bosonic system. Uh, but you see, we can't say that because the partition function sums over all fermions, even and odd. Okay, so we we not if the total f was fixed, then it's a non relativistic physics. Again, this f was fixed, number of electrons was fixed. Then this would be a trivial factor. It would be an overall factor. But the point is, it's much more serious because you see, when we look at the partition function, we sum up those states into one fermion or two fermions, three fermions or four fermions, and we add all those. And so it's relative signs between these contributions. That is much more serious than an overall sign. Is this clear? Okay. Now. Now. Well, uh, so, uh, suppose we consider n fermionic pairs like, uh, like the like what we did in statistical mechanics was like, and for for an n particle system, it was z one raised to the power n, right? I mean, the single particle. Uh, partition function was raised to be part and so does the same thing follow over here as well? Well firstly the single particle function part of uh, part the partition function be raised to the power n is only correct for uh, non-identical uh, particles. Okay? If you have identical bosons, it's more complicated. There's a boss distribution. Okay? Similarly this will lead to the Fermi distribution. Okay? Yeah. Uh, okay, excellent. But now, of course, uh, the thing that is often of interest to us, okay, the thing that is often of interest to us is computing not the, not minus 1 to the power f times e to the power minus beta h, trace of that. Although if you look to people who do supersymmetric quantum field theories, including myself, you might think they've forgotten because they often have computing this. <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> uh, uh, but the thing of physical interest um, um, is this guy. I mean the thing that somebody studies to somebody who's turning on a temperature in a lab will want you to compute. Is this without that? So what do we do? Suppose we've got a path in that room that computes the guy without this minus one we have. Then what do we do? Okay, what we have to do? Well, we make progress. We make progress because we know that uh, we know this object is pretty near. So, what, why, why don't we do, uh, do the following? Why don't we try to compute? Suppose instead of trying to compute trace 
A. We were we tried to compute trace A times minus one to the power n. But let me say that. Suppose suppose we computed psi psi B psi of this one. That would be equal to trace A. Because minus one to the power f times minus one to the power f is minus one to the power two f. And two uh, f is always an even integer, and therefore that's one. Minus one to the power two f is one. Okay? So what we want to do is instead of computing the trace of the Euclidean evolution operator, we want to compute the trace of the Euclidean evolution operator times minus one to the power f. Then we would have computed what we're physically interested. Okay. So what we want to do is to compute this object. We want to compute g psi psi e to the power minus beta h minus one to the power h and psi. That's what we want to compute. This is really equal to the partition part. The standard partition. Is this here? Okay. Now, now, um, what is this object instead of more? Well, remember what psi was. Psi was equal to. I'm going to remember what the psi was. It's a down plus of the psi. Okay. Now, what is minus one to the power f on psi? So minus one, minus one to the power f on psi doesn't change down, but changes up to minus. So it's equal to minus. Psi. Okay, and so we've got a beautiful new formula for fermions. Let me done is equal to d psi psi e to the power minus beta h. Minus sign. What does this formula tell us? This formula tells us that if we want to compute the partition function at finite temperature for fermions, all we have to do is compute the Euclidean partition function. Okay? All we have to do is compute the Euclidean partition function. Okay? On a circle of size circumference beta, but to make sure that the fermions, the while all bosons have periodic boundary conditions on this, all fermions have anti periodic boundary conditions. Okay? So, this is the very general prescription for computation of statmate partition functions in terms of uh, 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 quantum field theory type path integrals. You compute a partition function. On a circle, but flipping boundary conditions of the birds and the fermions. Uh, the fact that you have to flip boundary conditions uh, for those interested in supersymmetry means, of course, that even if your underlying theory is supersymmetric, the thermal partition function will not be computed by supersymmetric part of the table because the fields that go into each other, the birds and the fermions, have different boundary conditions. You the symmetry. Okay? And this, of course, is necessary for getting. Supersymmetry protects things. You find that temperature breaks. It's a basic. Oh, so this uh, anti-periodic boundary condition is just a reflection of the fact of the anti-commutator algebra followed by. Uh, probably it's anti Yeah, that's probably true. You know there are, there are many minus signs, fermions and some fundamental levels. <laughs> 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 But uh, I, I, this is the algebraic way uh, I had path I had for deriving it. I'm sure you could find some. So if I use that minus one to the power f times beta h, so then I will have the periodic even in shy. Yes. If you want to, so I can compute uh, fermionic path integrals uh, with periodic boundary conditions as well as anti periodic well, boundary conditions, it's a but with different quantities. Exactly. You know, any quantity that is sensible, you can compute any part. The question is, what is it, what are you computing? So, you know, 
not from the point of view of quantum entanglement. Suppose you compute some entanglement. Well, the question usually is, what is the Hilbert space interpretation? Okay. So, if you compute with periodic boundary conditions, okay, if you compute with periodic boundary conditions, then uh, the it's a fair computation, and it's actually often very interesting. This this one is called the Witten index for supersymmetric quantum entanglement. Very interesting one. Okay, this, but it's what it is is not crazy to the minus beta. It's minus one to the f times two. If you're interested in that quantity, that the path of technique that computes this is the one with periodic boundary conditions. And there are often reasons to be interested in that quantity. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that path of technology. It's just not the one that computes the thermal partition function. Is this clear? The thermal partition function is computed by this one. Is this clear? That's a good question. And uh, yeah. uh, other questions about this. Okay, now uh, I wanted to say uh, a word or two more about Euclidean continuation of fermionic quantum entanglement before we start our discussion of perturbation theory and the renormalization. Okay, oh, um, sorry, uh, just, just, uh, cleaning up from last class. Um, uh, maybe I'll do that. Let me, let me complete this and I'll just clean it. Okay, now when we discussed fermionic path entanglements in class, we came to the following conclusion. We came to the conclusion that that our evolution operator e to the power minus r in each t of t n t i will be equal to uh, Minus chi d psi, chi d psi uh, exponential of minus chi psi dot uh, minus i h chi psi. Minus i h chi psi, exactly. Okay, with initial and final one. The matrix elements of this operator were given by this quantity. Okay. This is worked out with the two state system, but of course it generalizes. Once you've got the basic system like the bosons, any copies of this can be any copies. Okay? Uh, this was our basic fundamental formula for the connection between evolution operators. The connection between evolution operators and the uh, fermionic path integrity. Now, uh, if we wanted to compute, uh, if we wanted to compute e to the power minus h dF minus di, just like you know, repeating the derivation, sort of like we did for the Poisson case, repeating the derivation. Well, very simply give us that will be chi d psi. This part won't change because it comes from you know inner products between states that we inserted. All this integral time. Uh, but this part, this basically minus i will become minus so minus h. And I don't want to show you understand all this very well. I thought there were, there, there were two things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the path integral ex expression for the matrix elements of this operator. Okay. Now, uh, though all this is obvious when you think of it, I thought once I would say this. Uh, just take you explicitly through how this works, how this applies to a particular g arc system. Uh, just so that you, uh, it's clear in your hands. Okay? So let's, uh, uh, let's see how this works for uh, uh, 
the simplest Dirac system, namely the Dirac equation, the Dirac system for massless real fermions in two dimensions. Okay, uh, I'm looking at one plus one equals two dimensions, just so that I can show you everything without without writing any matrix, any gamma matrix. Because it's so simple that you're right with the government. Right? And then the physics becomes totally clear. Okay? So let's remind ourselves for the, for, uh, for the Dirac system, the Dirac equation, and so on. Although you know very well, I'm teaching you this. Just remind me. More, more correctly, I'm reminding myself what this, the right signs are. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah? So we've got this, this spinner field. That obeys the equation del slash minus m sine zero. Now it obeys either this equation or the summaries around the place, and that depends on what your signature is space time. So let's check. Okay. Uh, the way to check is well, one way is to first go to momentum space. That's I suppose I've got this right. This would be I p slash minus m sine zero, and then you multiply this equation by I p slash minus m. Plus, plus, plus. Well, the yeah. Since this is equal to zero, it's also true that I P slash plus M on size is equal Okay? And now we expand this out to cross terms cancel. The non-cross terms are I P slash times I P slash. So then you get minus because there are two I's. And then P slash times P slash. But then using the fact that gamma mu anti commutative gamma nu is equal to two G mu nu or gamma mu nu. You can, of course, convince yourself that this is minus p squared, and this is now minus x squared. Sine is zero. Is this clear? Mangesh is this satisfied? So, what, what part of this satisfied? Uh, the half p slash p slash is uh, uh, p mu p mu. So, uh, it's by yeah. yeah, the minus. Yeah. Okay. The, the minus the yeah. It's just minus because of the i. P mu gamma P mu gamma mu gamma nu. Then you because this is multiplying something symmetric. You write this as gamma mu gamma nu, gamma nu plus gamma nu gamma nu by two. So that's g mu nu by two. Two g mu nu by two. So g mu nu so base pair. Okay? Fine. And this equation here, in our sign convention, is the correct one. Because it's minus p0 squared, sorry, so, so it's plus p0 squared, minus pi squared, minus n squared, and size equal to 0, it's the right massless equation, the right function equation. Good. So we've got the right equation here. Now, we need to get the right, right Lagrangian. Okay? Now we need to get the right Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian is either psi bar del slash minus m psi or this with an i. Okay. Basically the equation of motion has to be the right one. So when you knock off psi bar you should get the right equation of motion. Uh, this comes with either 1 or i. 1 plus minus i. Up to some psi bar i. Okay. okay. Now let's try to figure that out. This, of course, might depend on dimension and so on. Let's try to figure this out in the particular case of two dimensions. For the particular real two dimension for the energy system. We'll understand it. So, um, we have two dimensions, one plus one dimensions. And we have to remember, we, have, we are obliged when we write down a Dirac equation to work with gamma matrices such that gamma i dagger is equal to gamma i, gamma zero dagger is equal to minus gamma. So we want Pauli matrices or Pauli matrices times i. Okay, that obey this relation. This one uh, clearly gamma. So now there are, this is really one plus one dimensions. There's gamma one and gamma three. Uh, there's only one choice. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the, the natural thing to do. Gamma one is one of the sigma matrices. Gamma zero is i times another sigma matrix. But you see, one of the sigma matrices is special, namely sigma two. 
because it's purely imaginary. So what we can make Dirac's equation pure, completely real, if we make a good choice of, you know, of, of gamma matrices. So suppose we choose gamma zero equal to i times sigma, and the gamma one is equal to sigma. Okay, if we make this choice, this nice choice, then uh, uh, then Dirac's equation is completely real, which basically means is the observation that is consistent to choose your spinner here, because your equation wasn't real. You demanded your spinner was real. We find that there are no solutions to the equations. But the equation is real, you can choose your spin-up here consistently. Uh, the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, size of two. Yeah, you should have said that. Size of two. You need at least two, because you need two, uh, two matrices that don't compute with each other, and uh, certainly two dimensions to be given. So you need only two matrices. Okay? So now with this uh, with this choice, let's say that psi is equal to psi one and psi two. Let's work out the Dirac equation. Okay, uh, because our 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 Lagrangian was real. I mean, our, our spinner psi was real. Psi bar is just psi times gamma zero. Psi, I mean, psi transpose times zero. Okay. So all we have to do is to work out the matrix. So we've got psi transpose, then gamma zero, gamma zero, L zero plus uh, gamma one L. This is the thing we want to work out. Okay? But so gamma zero was I and sigma two, gamma zero square is minus one, because sigma two squared is minus one. Okay? So this is psi transpose that minus one that L zero. And yeah, gamma zero times gamma one, so that's i times sigma two times sigma one. Now sigma two times sigma one is minus i times sigma three. So this is i times minus i times sigma three. So that's sigma three. So I'll write plus sigma three times that one. Right. Now this quantity as written as two cross two guy is minus del zero plus del one zero zero. Minus del zero minus. Since it's diagonal, this can be also written as psi one minus del zero plus del one psi plus psi two minus del zero uh, minus the master. Psi. Ah, let let me let me get back to the master. Good, 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 good. So we got the master as well. Now first, because I'm going to have to. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Let me also. So the mass term is now what? The mass term is just minus i sigma. Okay? Uh, oh, sorry, it was plus i sigma. Uh, right, sorry, it's just sigma. I uh, It's i times minus i times sigma 2, so that's sigma 2. Okay, so the mass term uh, gives us. Um, Minus I am okay. So, and uh, if you have a mass term, um, uh, if you have a mass term, you have psi one. Uh, we get right. So psi one uh, minus two I am psi one. Okay, this comes to the minus sign, this comes to the plus sign, but that comes to the opposite order. So you reorder them. This, by the way, the fact that um, the fact that without the mass term, this splits into two different Lagrangians. A Lagrangian for psi 1 and a Lagrangian for psi 2 is the fact that you know very well that massless fermions can be chiral. On the other hand, the mass term requires you to couple uh, one chirality to the other. Uh, that this is the chirality, by the way, is very clear. Why is it the chirality? Can somebody explain why this psi 1 and psi 2 are the two chiral, chiral and anti-chiral spinners? How do you judge that? What does it mean for something to be chiral and anti-chiral? Projection of moment and the massless. 
at the moment we're not even talking about money. Let me just uh, right. But you know, there's this notion of chirality even before we go on. It's eigenvalue under gamma five. Gamma five is the product of gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Now, in two dimensions, the analog of that is the product of gamma zero, gamma one. Now, gamma zero was proportional to sigma two. Gamma one proportional to sigma one. So, gamma zero, gamma one is proportional to sigma three. Now, put some plus minus sign. Sigma three, of course, is direct. So, the two, the two chirality values are. There. The upper point and the bottom point. Okay? So, uh, so this is a very simple decomposition in two dimensions. Where you've got the upper component, this guy psi 1, by some convention is the chiral guy. The bottom component, psi 2, by some convention is the anti chiral guy. So it would be consistent to have the Lagrangian with only the chiral and not the anti chiral guy if the guy was massless, but a mass couple is the two. Okay? Now we worked out this uh, this Lagrangian uh, uh, here without this I here. Yeah. Wait, you're saying this formula is wrong? No, I'm saying uh, I should not come with it. This formula should come without an I? Yes. Let me check. Or uh, there should be overall I could uh, tell zero plus. Let me check that. See, oh, did I? Oh, you're saying I put an overall I here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, you're probably right. You're probably right. You're probably right about that. Okay. What I was computing was just this, and this. Uh, her point is, it just comes with a minus I sigma two. Minus I sigma two is uh, uh, minus I into minus I, so that's minus one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so two or three things about this that I wanted you to wanted uh, you to see. Um, we were hurry to this, but anyway. Um, now the first thing. Okay, firstly, now we get our our convention. Right? Should there be an overall factor or not? Um, in fact, they should. The Lagrangian should be Hermitian, right? So, uh, the, uh, if you consider the master, it's uh, psi bar m psi, but uh, your gamma naught, which is uh, used in the definition of psi bar, is anti Hermitian. So, there should be a. Yeah, there should be. Exactly, 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 exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, they, in fact, they should, and that's good way of saying it. But another way of saying it is that we have to make contact with this two state system. Okay, the two-state system path integral was a path integral that was minus chi psi one, with no i. Okay, minus the sample two. Okay, so the Lagrangian, the path integral we're going to get out of the Lagrangian is e to the power i times s. The time derivative term then should have an i in the Lagrangian so that the i goes away when we do e to the power i times s. Okay, so. Um, uh, so, the actual Lagrangian, let's say, should have an I here. Um, the actual Lagrangian, let me, to get perfect matching with this, I had a minus sign. So, minus I, so I let's put a minus sign. Okay? So, that the thing that appears inside the path integral is e to the power of this. So what appears in the path integral is e to the power i s. Okay, this minus i cancels that i s, so we just got what we have. So we got integral d psi of this. Okay, and this object now is exactly of the form that we had here. We can make this more manifest by now in the Fourier transform in space. So suppose we
uh, suppose we do a Fourier transform in space. So that we said psi 1 is equal to dk by 2 pi e to the power i k uh, psi 1 of x, uh, psi 1 of k. Suppose we said that. And similarly for psi 2, identical formula for psi 2. So psi i. This. Then what is this formula going to become? And formula then becomes d psi 1 d psi 1 of uh, k d psi 2 of k Ok? Exponential of integral dk by d pi uh, so psi 1 of k minus psi 1 of minus k psi 1 of k dot ok uh, plus psi 1 of minus k and then this is uh, i k psi 1 of k. This k is a special part, you understand that. Plus d k by 2 pi. Similarly with psi 2 of k with the psi root. Psi 2 minus k psi 2 of dot of k plus psi 2 of minus k uh, Okay, and then there is of course this term, which is uh, plus the d k by two pi uh, psi one of minus k psi two of k uh, with the two pi. Uh, that we were uh, 
that we were interested in computing. Is this clear? Okay, now there was a question about the Euclidean continuation. So, if we were interested in the Euclidean continuation, you remember what we had to do is, um, what was the rule? The rule was that what we had to do is to take this e to the power minus i h, and we replace this stuff here by, by minus h. Okay? Now, uh, <coughs> replacing this stuff by minus h, as, as you said, what is it? You did this, 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 as the shop was, was mentioning, is automatically achieved by the replacement p e is equal to i times the Right? Because then e to the power minus h integral t e will become e to the power minus i h integral t i. Okay? But this guy, okay, this guy is not supposed to be replaced. Okay, so let, let me let me let me say it again. Let me say it again. What is the Euclidean path in there? I'm going to give you a set of rules and then you see if it makes sense. The Euclidean path integral e to the power minus h minus minus h times c is generated by e to the power minus s Euclidean as usual where we have to get some rules. How do we get s Euclidean? Out of uh, uh, s minus uh, s so the rule is take t goes to uh, t goes to i t Minkowski okay. from, to go from s Euclidean to s Minkowski. What we have to do is set t Euclidean is equal to i times t Minkowski. Right? T Euclidean is right next to Minkowski. Okay? Now, what will that be? That will automatically account for giving you this part correctly. But for this part, okay, uh, that Is working 
for the non-time derivative terms. It's not working for the time derivative terms. The time derivative terms need to pick up an extra plus or minus. I'll leave you, you to figure out where this plus or minus is. Okay? So what we have to do is basically take this gamma zero goes to alpha gamma zero. Now this is a very satisfying thing. It's a very satisfying thing because if you want to work out the path integral in Euclidean space, you would imagine that you would need to use gamma zeros, gamma matrices that obey the Euclidean Clipper algebra. Gamma mu gamma nu is equal to Euclidean GMU. But of course, multiplying gamma zero by an i precisely uh, precisely makes it one. Okay? So the analytic continuation of the fermionic path integral, and though we worked it out in this two-dimensional case, you can see immediately that the lesson is completely tender. Involves also a replacement of gamma zero by a Euclidean gamma zero. Is this clear? Okay. Um, fine. The last thing I should say about these analytic continuations, uh, the last thing I should say about these analytic continuations is that operators that were complex conjugates of each other uh, do not continue to complex conjugates of each other under analytic continuation. Why is that? You see, suppose you have an operator A. Under time evolution, this Heisenberg sets, how does it behave? Uh, a of C is equal to e to the power minus i h t a of 0 power h. Okay? Now, suppose a at 0 had had a, a dagger at 0 as its, as its dagger. Now, under time evolution, A of T dagger is equal to e to the power minus i h t during the rule that when you dagger, you change it, reverse the order. Uh, A 0 dagger e to the power i h t, which is exactly equal to A dagger at T, the time evolution of the dagger operator. Minkowski space, of course, hermeticity is preserved by Heisenberg evolution. However, in order to in order to uh, to employ this trick, this trick of analytic continuation uh, to compute things, okay, we replace this e to the power i h i h t by we, we looked at this Euclidean operator, A Euclidean, which was um, e to the power minus h t, e to the power a of 0, e to the power h. Okay? Now, if we take uh, the dagger of this, A Euclidean of t, dagger. Okay. This is equal to e to the power h t, a of 0, e to the power minus h t, dagger, which is not equal to a dagger as a function of t, because this plus minus is a wrong. Okay. Because these e to the power h t are not uh, unitary. Not unitary. That's exactly. That's the reason. Exactly right. It's not unitary. But what this means is that two operators that were related to each other by complex conjugation in the Minkowski path, or two insertions that should just have been complex conjugates of each other in the Minkowski path, will not be complex conjugates of each other in the Euclidean path. This is something you must remember. This causes no end of confusion. Okay? The only the only relevant notion of complex conjugation is the notion in real physical Minkowski space. Okay? 
the the uh, notion of complex conjugation in Euclidean space is the correct notion should be that inherited from Minkowski space. So that objects that are complex conjugates of each other should not just be complex conjugates of each other in Euclidean space, rather should obey a relation that you can deduce from uh, from what we just said. Okay? Uh, uh, just a small aside for those those of you who, uh, who know what I'm talking about. When we study two-dimensional conformal field theory in radial quantization, uh, when we take a, an operator of uh, primary operator of dimension delta, we expand it as O n by Z pi plus delta. And then the correct notion of complex conjugation is not that uh, this is related to the anti-analytic part. When it's that O n, O minus n are complex conjugates of each other. This comes from tracing through the right notion of complex conjugate in Minkowski space and then seeing what that means for these coefficients rather than blindly working incorrectly in Euclidean space. This is one example of how you can easily go wrong. It's just a, a portion. For those of you who don't, don't want to talk about it, forget it. Uh, we might actually talk about some of this by the end of the course. Let's see. Okay, but uh, 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 for now, it's a, it's a caution that we must be careful of not being too naive about uh, uh, about what complex conjugation means in Euclidean space. It shouldn't just work the way it naively should. Of course, if you're thinking Euclid, the Minkowski path integral, everything should just work work just fine. Okay, great. Um, fine. Uh, last, uh, last, last bit of cleaning up from uh, the, the last class. Um, uh, okay, I'll do this in a problem. We'll have this in a problem. I wonder, we were talking about these conserved currents. Remember, more identities of conserved currents. I wanted you to, uh, to, I wanted you to, I wanted to show you that two, two different equivalent notions of conserved currents for translations. The first is to do what we did in the last class. The second is to couple the theory with respect to a metric and then vary the metric. And these two turn out to be the same. But we, we have this in the problem set. Um, okay, fine. So I think this is all I want to say about in my first uh, first uh, rush with path integrals and quantum field theory. Um, uh, I thought at some point that we would discuss BRS quantization now. But um, reflecting about it, I thought the better place for discussing it would be to discuss, to talk about, to discuss it when we start discussing beta functions for gauge theories. So let's postpone that discussion. Um, any questions, comments, or um, any questions, comments, or uh, anything we'd like to discuss uh, before we move on? Okay, now this basically, uh, at this point I'll basically declare our discussion on path integrals complete uh, and we move on unless there are questions about this. Yeah, please do. Okay, fine. So now we, we, we now going to turn to less, slightly less, you know, in this. That's A dagger of T, which by definition is e to the power blah blah blah. E is uh, acting on A dagger of zero. Will be related to um, e to the power minus 2ht A T dagger times e to, e to the power plus 2ht. Maybe I got the minus. Oh, no, it just takes A dagger and equivalent uh, dagger. Uh, I That's exactly right. So, right, exactly. So, this A dagger of E is e to the power minus H D A of 0 dagger e to the power uh, H. No, I understand that you can do it separately, that's perfectly fine. But there is no uh, apparent relation in, in the Euclidean. Uh, no, but this, you can use this to find a relation. 
without going back to Windows. No, no, by going, by going, by going. It's you know the notion so should be so that after you analytically continue back to Minkowski space, the rel relevant matrix and objects are objects. That's basically the principle. Okay? And the point is that Euclidean and there's an I going from Euclidean to Minkowski space. So that's not the same as being complex conjugates before you. That's basically. Okay, other questions about it? Okay, we'll stop in like five or ten minutes. Let me just start this uh, uh, this discussion. Okay, so first let me just, let me summarize. What have we learned so far? We have learned that given a quantum system, there is a way to represent its evolution in terms of a path integral. Okay, the Hilbert space is obtained by slicing the path integral along lines of constant time. Uh, we've learned that the uh, Hilbert, that the that the that insertions of fields of that path integral inside uh, this integral uh, compute uh, time order operator insertions in the quantum field theory. We've learned that in edge theory, this uh, uh, slicing operation produces a Hilbert space. Uh, the slicing operation produces a Hilbert space with uh, uh, with uh, which is to be thought of as uh, one way of thinking of it is made up of fewer degrees of oscillate, you know, wave functionals of fewer fields than you have in your path integral plus a constraint. That's pretty good. Uh, we learned that uh, uh, fermionic systems can also be represented in path integrals, but as integrals over Grassmann variables. Uh, we learned that. Uh, um, that uh, uh, there's a Euclidean continuation of all these path integrals that often is mathematically better defined than the Minkowski path integral. It's often the thing we will actually com compute. But there are clear rules for going from the Euclidean answer to the Minkowski. Uh, and we've also learned that the uh, path integral for gauge theories, we, we learned the path integral for gauge theories, um, uh, at least perturbatively seemed hard to make sense of in the continuum because of these gauge zero modes. But there was a way of uh, curing that by this funny proper trick. Finally, uh, we've uh, seen examples of uh, interesting uh, uh, relations that we can deduce using path integral tricks. Uh, these interesting relations were uh, Schwinger Dyson equations, odd identities for conserved counts. Uh, and we'll see more of these as we, as we continue. Okay? This is a summary of what we've tried to what we've discussed so far. Okay. But now, you know, one of the problems with uh, all of this discussion is that while it sounds uh, quite interesting, right? I mean who who deny that it sounds interesting? Uh, transition amplitude is represented as an integral over all possible paths. An amplitude for each path, you sum it up. It sounds interesting. Suddenly it was very interesting to find discover this quantum mechanics. Um, and actually, this this form of formulation finds its real home somehow in quantum field theory, because every other way of looking at quantum field theory mutilates the underlying Lorentz invariance of the structure. But the path integral preserves so beautifully, because it's given in terms of the action of the Hamiltonian, and the action is a beautifully Lorentz invariant quantity. So these final path integrals, which are uh, which are finally which are sort of like an exotic thing in the study of quantum mechanics. You know, it's perfectly possible to go through a very good quantum mechanics course without really hearing about Feynman path integrals because, you know, where do you use them, really? Oh, okay, become more than, a, more than an exotic curiosity when we study quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, they become, for many purposes, the best way of thinking. Okay. Now, uh, this sounds great, except there is a problem. And this problem is not with the form the path integral formulations, it's an apparent problem with the quantum field. And the problem, as you know, is the problem with divergence. 
The problem is that when you try to compute any of the natural observables, when you try to compute any of the natural observables that we've discussed, insertions of fields inside path integrals, we often find infinite, the answer to be infinite in a very puzzling and very strange way. Okay? So that it's uh, that makes it seem that makes it seem first sight like while what we started out trying to do was a good attempt and had some formal beauty, it actually makes no sense. You know, a lot of people have concluded that for a very long time. This famous quote from Landa, physicist whom that I hold in the highest regard. Uh, but of course, he made very great mistakes. This being one of them. And which he said, uh, you know, uh, which he announced at some point that quantum field theory is dead. Uh, in, I think in the 50s and 60s. And should be buried, but with appropriate honors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Landau himself makes significant contributions to the study of quantum field theory. It's not like he said it up in the air. Um, okay, and certainly this problem of the infinities was at the, was at, was at the back of many people's minds. Things. Because Landau said this after renormalization of QED. But uh, there was a problem with that we discussed as well. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to have to come to grapple with this. So, but before we do that, we have to see what the problem is. So, this class, I'll just tell you about the problem we need the solution to this class. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, suppose let's see the problem in a simple context that is scale of it. Say, 5 to the 40. You've seen all this before, but five minutes, five minutes will hurt. Uh, this will also serve to illustrate how to generate the perturbation series from the path integral. Okay. So the question, suppose we want to compute the combination. E by time ordered uh, time ordered insertions of four operators. Uh, 
by the way, I'm eating the colloquium. Is anyone here interested in the colloquium? Stop. I shouldn't. I might get in trouble. We have to A little bit too much. Uh, e to the power minus uh, uh, minus del phi two plus m squared by square root two. Okay, and then we will Taylor expand. So we have downstairs. Okay, we have one plus lambda by four phi. Um, 
as I said, we, leave, we, we have a couple of derivations. Let's say one derivation. This is in a whole bucket. Okay. I'm not going to spend time talking about it. Okay. It's a simple thing. Okay? Is the statement of is the statement? Okay, excellent. So now, now then, this quantity is now very simple to compute using width theorem. Oh, width, by the way, width theorem was derived using some operator stuff. It's fine. It's by far the easiest way to think of that whole, that whole thing. Okay. Um, this is now very easy to compute using all of this. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, what would we do? Uh, we would go to the Fourier basis. So as usual, we would have phi of x, phi of x, and phi of b, b, b. Plug that into here. So uh, the quantity that we we wish to compute is so we would all yeah. We would have e to the power i p one dot x one by two pi to the power d e to the power two i p two dot x two two pi to the power d e to the power i p four dot x four pi to the power d of pi p one well, all these are replaced by now P insertions. P1, phi, P2, phi, P3, phi, P4. We will then work all this out also in terms of momentum. Okay, so the quadratic part of the action here is just e to the power minus phi of minus P, phi of P, in a p squared plus m squared. Okay? Uh, DDP. Okay? Then, it follows immediately that phi of p phi of minus p prime this expectation. This is just the fact that yeah, x squared itself can't show here. Right. Suppose you've got e to the power minus a x squared by p. And we want to know what the expectation value of x squared is. Okay? Um, we want to know what the expectation value of x squared is. That is simply uh, d by d a minus 2 d by d a of e to the power minus a x squared by 2. Okay? Now e to the power uh, a x squared by 2. Suppose we are interested in uh, uh, this this quantity divided by this, then this becomes, you know, so, so the expectation of x by we divide it. This becomes this, then log of integral e to the power minus a x squared by 2. Now, log of e to the power minus a x squared by 2, we can get by dimension of this. Because e, clearly, e to the power a x squared by 2 dx goes like x. x goes like 1 over square root a. So this is log. This is log of on step you don't care about by square root. Okay. Uh, and then differentiating that gives us log uh, that's that gives us d by d a of log a minus two in the half go away from here. Okay? So x squared e to the power minus a x squared by 2 divided by integral e by a x squared by 2 it's just one way okay so this tells us here that this object that this contraction ok 
Okay, is equal to 1 over p squared plus n squared. Okay, times 2 pi d times. All this you basically know, right? It's a language. So my name. Okay. Okay. If you don't mind, I'll just go through this quickly. Okay? Uh, if you're you can check like the factors of two pi and so on. They all be in the factors actually. Okay. Um, and so we apply a mixed theorem after writing everything in the momentum space with this rule for the contraction. Okay, let's quickly do that and stop today's class. So we quickly do that before we stop today's class. So what do we have here? We have 5v1, 5v2, 5v3, 5v4. Here, we're supposed to take this phi of x1, x2, x3, x4, right in the momentum space. But that just becomes phi of so let's write it out once. Integral phi to four dx. Dx is d, let's say k1 by 2 pi by d, d k, d, d, k2 by 2 pi by d, 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 k3 by 2 pi by d, 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 k4 by 2 pi d, times 2 pi by 2 pi d, Delta function k1 plus k2 k3 plus k4 times phi k1 phi 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 just by inserting definitions. Is this clear? Any questions by the way, please stop me. I'm going fast here. Assuming you've this is a modulus from the area, right? But if this is too fast and you're not understanding, please stop. Is this okay? Great. So now let's look at the first term. Okay. One thing that we could of course have is when we have contractions of these two guys with each other. That you get such contributions in order lambda to the zero. Okay. So in this in this expression we will get terms like uh, delta of p1 plus p2 uh, 1 by p1 squared plus m squared 1 by p2 squared plus m sorry delta of p3 plus p4 1 by p3 squared plus m Okay? And three such expressions. Because we can contract P1 with P2, P1 with P3, and P1 with P4. These are the expressions that occur at order lambda to the power zero. And what it's telling us is that there is uh, that at leading order, four point functions are just products of two point functions. Then we have a new contribution and order lambda to the power. The new contribution in order lambda to the power 1 is when we take one of these guys and contract these with the four things. Remember, nothing is allowed to stay uncontracted. Okay, uh, you also have contributions actually when you contract uh, uh, when you contract two of these with one another uh, and these with two of those and then. So one two point function plus connected two point functions and so on. You have many such contributions. Let me focus on the one that's going to turn out to be most important. Let us contract this guy with this guy, this guy with this guy, and so on. Let's compute that object. Okay? Now to compute that object, we're supposed to sum over all contractions. What? How many ways are there of making the contraction? This fellow, 5p1, so now we're in momentum space, let's forget about all of this. Right? P1, P2, P3. P1 
has a choice of four values with which to contract. P2 now has a choice of three values with which to contract. P3 and P4. So we get four factorial ways of choosing the way, number of uh, ways of doing this contract. All these contractions give us identical expressions. Because though they contract with different k's, k's are double variables which are So we just get a, an overall factor of four factorial. There was one over four factorial in our action. I wrote that out, but you have it in your notes. The four factorial cancels the one over four factorial. This is the reason I wrote the one over four factorial. Okay? Uh, so we, what's left over is a sign of minus lambda. And then what we get is uh, uh, 1 over P1 squared plus X squared. And that's it. And the delta function. And the delta function. Okay. The, this contribution is often represented in diagram. That, that's what it was. It was a final diagram. We've got some insertion of phi of P1. It goes into a vertex operator. Sometimes the factor of number is called a vertex factor. Um, okay. Great. Okay. Now, let me look. Four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me go to one higher order. By the way, you see, I said, uh, let's, let's represent the zero order guy in a final. Zero thought of guy was this P1, P2. Hmm? Now, this only works since the contraction only is only between equal momenta. It only works if uh, P1 is equal to P2, and P3 is equal to P4. That was this guy. And then there were three other five minutes. You could go from P1 to P3. Okay, this was the insertion of P1 and P2. P2 but you could have connected them in other ways. The diagrams at first order that I did not talk about were these diagrams. Well, let's say this was P1 to P2 and then P3 to P4. Okay. The reason I'm not talking about this will become clear a little later. Um, let, me, let me move on to one higher. I'm interested in the graph that you get. The, the contribution that you get when you take two of these vertex factors, two of these integrals of a factor, and then you connect things in the following fashion. You've got one vertex from which emerges four legs because it's an interaction vertex. And another vertex from which emerges four legs. It's an interaction vertex. And in a sense, I will make precise as we go along. The really non trivial graph of this order is the one where you get when you connect. One of these links to this one, one of these links to this one. And these ones to the external. That's, for instance, okay, P1, P2, P3. This is what's called a one loop Feynman graph. Okay, now let's study this one loop Feynman graph. Let's compute 
what it animates. What's what's going on? We have these these four four files from each vertex, and we're supposed to contract them in the way that I described. Okay, so that all it's clear, right? That firstly we're going to forget a factor of minus lambda by four factorial squared by two by expanding the exponential in the data series. Then we're going to get lots of factors which count how many identical cross terms we have. And then we're going to get the factor for each of these terms. Okay, symmetric factors. Yes, exactly. The symmetric factors, let's just do the counting. Okay. How, how can we count this? Look. Now this P1 guy. Okay. Um, we had each of these two vertices. We had each of these vertices. P1 guy, the P1 guy has two choices. Will it connect to something in the first vertex or the second vertex? It's a factor of two. Then, once it's chosen, chosen which vertex it wants to connect to, it has four choices for which guy to connect to them. Now, in the graph that I've drawn, P2 has no choice about which vertex to go to, because it must, must contract with the same one that we want. But it still has a choice of three, for which leftover five to contract with. So we've got two and a four into three. Now, P3 has no choice about which vertex to contract with. It must contract with the other one. But, one, uh, but in the other one, it could contract with 4 and P4 that would contract with 3. Great. Now what's left is the self-contractions. There are only two ways of self-contractions. Of the two leftover guys here, this guy could contract with this and that, or vice versa. So there's an additional factor of 2. Um, now you see that this is 4 factorial into 4 factorial divided by 4 factorial squared because it's left over half. So the factor for this graph, okay, the factor for this graph is lambda squared by 2. Okay? And now that we've got the lambda squared by 2, uh, we also have the expression for each of these. So we have each of these propagator factors left. So in all such graphs, of course, we have the overall factors of 1 over p1 squared plus n squared, 1 over p2 squared plus n squared, 1 over p3 squared plus n squared, 1 over p4 squared plus n squared. That's this, 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 and this propagator. But in addition, we've got this guy traveling with some momentum, let's say p. But remember, there's a delta function in each of these vertices. So the momentum here is not independent. The momentum here, if it's going in, is equal to minus of p1 plus p2 plus p3, uh, plus p, p prime. Similarly, there would be a formula to relate the momentum here to the sum of these three. And the fact that these, these are consistent is only true because there's an overall momentum conservation. Okay? So we get an overall momentum conserving measure. 2 pi so d times delta of p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus p4. Okay? Times, let's say that p1 plus p2 is equal to minus p3 plus p4. Is equal to q. Let's just set a name. So then times we get p d p prime we call it. let's call that r. p d r by 2 pi to the power d divided by r squared plus m squared into 1 over r plus q the whole thing. Expansion of this propagator is equal to this times this times this times lambda square by 2. <laughs> well, okay, so this times this times this. Okay? And that's the expression. You see, it's quite simple. <laughs> you know, these 
simple theories. Uh, by the way, people invent fancy rules to try to understand what this factor would turn out to be. These are called symmetry factors. I've never understood that rules now are applied. <laughs> okay. I, I find uh, by far the easiest way in any situation is to do the computation. Okay. I follow the security. Okay. So, uh, uh, great. Um, uh, okay. So, this is very simple. It looks very simple, very beautiful. And actually, if you compare to older perturbations, by which I mean trying to compute the same kind of thing using second order perturbation theory the way we do in quantum mechanics. Okay? Using creation and annihilation operators, exchanging. So it's, it's actually much, much better. Actually, textbooks nowadays don't even have that, so you guys don't see how much better <laughs> it is. It's, you know, it's a bit much superior technique. Okay? And this looks like very beautiful answers we've got. This step, this step, this step is okay. You say, well, this is an integral. Um, uh, this is an integral. And, you know, okay, so we can just work this integral out. Okay, but there's a problem. Suppose D, actually, there's no problem in D. Okay, but in D is four of greater than problem. The problem is that this integral doesn't converge. It doesn't converge at all equals it. As you can see, a very large R, this integral goes like ddr divided by r to the 4. Okay? And uh, in d equals 4, that's log divergent. The regular and 4, that's worse divergent. Okay? So you get an answer that just is infinity. And uh, you might worry, have I computed everything in the same order with these infinities cancel? Uh, no, no, no. It's infinity, and it's infinity, you know. It's nothing to do with it. Um, you might wonder, okay, so the question is what's going on? What's going on? Why are we getting infinity? Is it because quantum field theory is dead and needs to be better appropriate honors? <laughs> <laughs> or is it because of something else? And the answer is that if you actually work out this path integral, it is infinity. It's just it's true. But this is not the right way to define quantum field theory. That's the point. The point is quantum field theory is defined as infinity. It's defined when you take a Lagrangian like this with what's called a cutoff, which we'll describe in the next case. And you take the parameters of the Lagrangian, this lambda, for instance, as a function of that cutoff. The cutoff is a cutoff in momentum space. So the problem is coming when we go to very large momentum. So you Take the parameters in the Lagrangian as a function of the cutoff and take the limit cutoff going to infinity not by holding the parameter fixed, but by taking the parameter to scale as some appropriate function of that cutoff. That defines a, will, a good theory. Okay? It's understanding, it's this fact and the understanding of this uh, that is the problem of, is the question of renormalization, okay? which we will turn to uh, discussing. Uh, a good reference for the next class is a paper written by Polchinski um, called Effective Lagrangians, Renormalization and Effective Lagrangians. Um, Renormalization and Effective Lagrangians, 1983. It's nuclear physics. It's a good reference. You might want to bring it to the next class. Okay, thank you. Next class on Friday, as usual. Thank you.